next we'll invite um, our superintendent Dixon for the super for her superintendent report. I I got a couple messages here about time and are we can get everything done today. I think we we are a capable resilient group. We will we'll be we'll adjust and adapt. We'll be fine. Thank you, um, board members. We are going to hear something today that I don't think we've ever had a report on that I can recall in the 10 years that I've been here, 10 plus. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about COVID and everybody that has played a part in our school system in both mitigating the virus and keeping school going. And we haven't talked much about our school nurses. And Betty Sue Hinkson and Kendra Muir, whom you'll, you will hear from, uh, put a report together, and Betty Sue sent it to me, oh gosh, I, about a month ago, I guess. And I was so impressed just looking at the data and being reminded of all of the things that our school nurses do. And yet, during this time frame, they have been expected to do so much more. And there's an assumption, I think, across the country that we're like everybody else, and we have a school nurse in every single school and multiple nurses. And so often I've been in conversations over the last couple of years where a health department or somebody will say, well, let's have our school nurses do that. And uh, it's been a good reminder that we, um, we don't have the resources that we need. And yet every year there's a, there's a cry to the legislature to add funding for school nurses. We have the opportunity to have more access to school nurses than we've had in the past through uh, funding that opened that up. But I wanted you to hear what these great ladies do. So I want to introduce you to Kendra Muir, um, who is one of our um, nursing and, and uh, wellness specialists, and Betty Sue Hinkson. And Kendra, they both work with us and with the Department of Health. Um, so it's sort of a, an interesting relationship that we have, but we consider them our own, both of them. So um, I'll turn the time to Kendra and Betty Sue, and they're going to give you a summary. The full report is in your backup, and so you can look into details at your leisure, but uh, wanted you to, and the public, to hear a summary of their work. Thank you both. And I think somebody is driving the slides. Jerry, is that you? As he's... Can you not, hear me okay? Then. Is it Jeff? Well, let me see if I can help. Sid, may I ask a quick question? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just, uh, so you said these ladies work with both USBE and the Department of Health. So who actually pays their salaries? How are they funded? I'll have you answer that, Betty Sue, if you don't mind. I can answer that. Um, I work for the Utah Department of Health, and we have an MOU um, with the Board of Education. Can you hear me okay? I feel like I'm quiet. <laughs> um, we um, have the MOU with the, the Board of Education. Prior to COVID, I was coming here one day a week out of the five days that I worked. Um, and in the process, I've kind of backed myself into a corner where um, I couldn't get all the work done anymore before COVID hit. It wasn't because of COVID, but there was just so much responsibility being added that I pled with um, the Board of Education to hire their their um, school nursing specialist, which uh, they were finally able to fill. Um, so um, she works for the Board of Education. Um, we haven't, and we haven't, we need, probably need to update our MOU with the Department of Health because we kind of visualize that we kind of do the opposite. So I'm with the Department of Health, come over here and collaborate. Um, she will be with the board here and go over to the Department of Health and collaborate. She's been involved in quite a few meetings. Okay. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, do you both, who collaborates with the on the ground school nurses and how many are there of these wonderful people? <laughs> uh, we both collaborate with the, the nurses. Um, they're, they're used to me being their contact because we haven't had the two positions open and they are gradually getting used to the idea that we have two people that they can ask the questions to. And um, you can, in your board backup, you do have um, both a brochure that highlights uh, the annual report. I've been doing this annual report for the five years that I've been in this position, uh, and, and it's just updated with the information that comes um, from the stool. The, the nurses do an uh, end of year report for me, uh, and I collaborate the data, and I never want to ask for data that I don't 
give them back in some way that they can use, and that's what this is. So if you want to advance to the next slide. Um, oh, let me finish answering your question. Um, but uh, in the brochure, it talks on the very front uh, of the, the numbers that we have of the school nurses, and we have 293 school nurses in the state that I'm aware of. Uh, that equates to about 241 FTEs. So you know by the number of schools over 1,000 that that's not a nurse in every school, not even close. And this number is actually so much higher. It's twice what it was when I started this position, really. So it has increased quite a lot. So if you will advance to this next slide, this is, or sorry, this particular slide here. This is our school health workload report that I have all the nurses who receive any kind of funding from the state. So we have a small um, appropriations for school nurses that uh, they can apply for, and 39 out of, out of the 41 districts apply for that funding. And so I get really good data. I, um, I have about 99% of all district students that are represented in the data that I collect. Uh, I, I don't get as much data from charter schools because not as many charter schools have a nurse. There's 91 questions in this particular uh, report. Next slide. Um, so page nine of the annual report um, will shows the student to school nurse ratio um, by school district for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, our school nurses work very hard to ensure that our students are safe and healthy. The student uh, to school nurse ratio can determine nurse capacity and services that the school nurses accomplish throughout the school year. There are many factors to consider when determining the appropriate school nurse staffing level at each local education agency. Total student enrollment has primarily been used in the past to determine this. However, the school's needs and the students' needs should also be addressed, such as specific health care needs of the population and social determinants of health. There's no one-size-fits-all um, to determine the, the appropriate ratios for this. And just a, a note, um, that particular graphic uh, only shows through Rich. We do have the data for all of them. It just didn't fit on the, on the slide. So pay, go to page 9 in the, in the um, report, and you'll be able to see for each district. Uh, next slide, yes. Yeah. So this shows uh, what our chronic health conditions are from each of, um, each of the, well, mostly the, the big four that I call them the big four. So that would be your asthma, anaphylaxis, diabetes, and seizures. And uh, about three years ago, we added also mental health conditions. Uh, and so based on all the, the mostly, um, as you, as, um, you saw in, in the, the slide prior where um, you can see the responses that I get, 99% being the charter schools, or excuse me, the districts, and then um, just a smaller percent of the, of the charter schools. But those reported to me, we have um, uh, t over 20,000 students with asthma that are uh, reported to the schools, uh, around 8,000 with anaphylaxis, just over 2,000 with diabetes, just over 1,000 with seizures, and then um, over 13,000 students with mental health conditions. This is on uh, the second page of the brochure, so if you um, if you have the brochure, it's on the uh, inside, and the same graphic is shown there, and it's also um, in the report on pages four and five. Next. Throughout Utah schools, student staff and sometimes visitors receive life-saving medications throughout the school day. Prescription medications um, ordered for students and schools require the school nurse to provide a comprehensive training uh, to staff and follow up to keep our kids healthy while learning. Um, during the 2020-2021 school year, um, epinephrine, which is ordered for severe allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, was ordered uh, 3,907 times. Uh, glucagon, which is for diabetics, patients experiencing severe hypoglycemia, was ordered uh, 1,786 times. Uh, seizure rescue medication uh, for grand mal or tonic-clonic seizures um, was ordered 285 times, and asthma medications were ordered over 5,000 times. Um, some medications are prescribed PRN, which also means as needed, uh, while others are prescribed and scheduled daily um, for students in schools. And that data is found on um, page five and six of the report. We have a question from a board member, um, Member Earl. Yeah, I just have a, when you say ordered, 
You're ordering medications for children? Sorry, the oh. health care provider ordered, ordered, so. And then brings those, the child brings those in, the parent brings those in. Sorry, let me clarify That's that. Correct. Okay, I was just trying to, that was, because we've used the, I, I have a diabetic son, so then I was trying to understand, are we ordering medications for kids, but you're saying they're bringing those in right. so they can be used in the school. Okay. That's correct. We also have, um, because of some laws passed, we also have stock albuterol, um, mm -hmm. stock epinephrine, and stock uh, seizure medications yeah. as well for the schools. No, correction, no stock seizure rescue Sorry. medications, just the stock epinephrine and stock um, inhalers. The rest are student specific that um, the uh, their, their specific health care provider would write the order, and then the parent would bring the medication. All right, next slide. Sorry. So this shows uh, medications, the emergency rescue medications that were actually administered. And I'm going to start at the bottom. I, I should have flipped this. But the seizure re rescue medications, which are student-specific only, we don't have stock on that, uh, were administered 27 times in the last year. Glucagon for students with diabetes was administered four times. And then if you move up, these are the, the three stock medications that um, we have specific laws that allow in the schools that we don't have to have uh, the, the parent provide. So naloxone uh, was administered once. That's for um, overdose. Epinephrine was in, uh, administered 31 times, and 17 of those were student-specific, and 14 of those were stock epinephrine. And then asthma inhalers, that's a really new law. We've only had it in effect one year. So uh, having, um, we had asthma inhalers were administered to students 30, uh, 3506, uh, 3,506 times. Uh, most of those were student-specific, 3,502, and only four so far uh, were administered as stock albuterol. But like I mentioned, it's a brand new law. We expect to see that number increase. So these are students that uh, may not have had uh, medication. We're having an emergency, a healthcare emergency, and because we had the stock medications um, available, we were able to potentially save their lives. All right, next slide. Oh, that's our last slide. Does uh, anybody have any questions? Um, well, I've, I've got one. I'll go, well, I've got several, but a quick question. On the reporting requirements, like for inhalers and that, is that is that up to a certain grade? Or I just see a great deal of difficulty when somebody's having their little, well, they have an attack and they grab their inhaler that, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to report up to the state. <laughs> they they yes. only report at the end of the year, so we they don't notify us. So you try us. to assess that, right? I, I think the number's got to be higher when I look at the total student count. And those are the ones where the nurse or the the person the nurse uh, delegated the inhaler administration to. So. Uh, the nurse isn't in the school every day. They um, delegate or they train lay staff to help the student and, uh, with the inhaler using asthma as a specific example. So those are the ones that were reported to us that the student needed assistance. There is a law that allows a student to carry their own inhaler and EpiPen. Uh, we don't know how often those are, are administered because they're doing that themselves. Right. So you're right, there are quite a, there, there's a much higher number. Okay, and then my second question, I'll just take the liberty because I'm chairing here, but I think it will be kind of relevant with the air quality, with the fires and everything that's um, going on. Are, are, are you at the state or USBA, are we trying to track incidences and all of that for the quality of health? I'm more so concerned about Wasatch Front than the rural, but rural has been hit with that. Is that something that is on you guys' radar to... It's definitely on our radar. Radar. It's not something we really have the mechanism for tracking. Uh, I work closely with the asthma program over at the Department of Health, and they've set up the um, recess guidelines that we make sure all the schools are aware when they should be keeping their students inside. But as far as uh, absences based on air quality, I don't have that data. Okay. Um, thank you. We, we do have a few lights on. Um, Member Lear. Thank you. Um, I had a, a concern. Uh, you said that the most of the charters, and there are 130-ish charter schools, don't have a school nurse, and I'm assuming that means they don't have access to a school nurse? 
uh, that I have no record of them having any, any contact with a school nurse. And so that's about 12% of our students that have, that are sort of at risk. Is there, is there a contact in your office that, that the, uh, a charter school director could call if they're, I mean, it's kind of a slow response to an emergency, but are, do we know what they're doing to deal with the hundreds of situations that you just identified here? Um, it, it's a little bit of a don't ask, don't tell, but um, they are able to contact. They have my contact information. I send them emails periodically, uh, and they are, they are able to contact Kendra. That's part of our jobs. We not only support the school nurses, but we do support those schools without a nurse mm -hmm. as well to help them answer questions. We cannot, though, go to the school and train the staff on what to do, and we cannot delegate medication uh, for a student that we haven't written a health care plan, and that's not our role here at the state. So uh, my advice is always to the smaller schools that don't have a nurse or the charter schools that they need to find one. They need at least contract with um, a parent okay. even who may be doing it on a volunteer basis or even just long enough for them to come in and write the health care plan, train the staff. It doesn't have to be a full-time position. Uh, just it could be pretty minimal and then just but but... Um, once they do that, that nurse is then responsible for evalu supervision and evaluation. And I don't mean supervision being there all the time, just being available by phone. If the person that it's delegated to has a question, they can contact that person and then that um, nurse would also go in and make sure that that person is doing it as they were taught and doing it appropriately. One brief follow-up, Chair. Yeah, follow-up. Um, so you don't have any record of which schools might be contracting with um, individuals or do you? I, I know of the ones that um, receive funding through USBE um, and, and every once in a while I will hear or get an email. I'm, I contract with this, with this charter school as their nurse and I have, and have for years and I've never known about it. So oh. I know that there are more out there that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. I manage a, the listserv for all the school nurses and I have for 15 years. So uh, every time I hear of a nurse anywhere, I add them to that list. Charter, um, public, private, Small, district, rural, anything, whatever. anything. I add them to this list and I, those are just the ones I know about. I, that's so helpful information, and I, it, it, I hope we can maybe find a way to provide some grants or something so uh, that yes. all it's, schools might have access to, because it might seem like a small number, as a gentleman pointed out this morning, but that's 500 of somebody's kids and that, that need emergency attention, and, and I hope we can look for some way to, to facilitate that. Thank you very much for the Absolutely. information. Um, Member Cannon. I have two questions. Uh, the first one, you uh, indicated that the number of nurses has increased greatly over the five years that you have been doing this. How have you been able to do that? And has, uh, have, has funding become available, if so, from where? And, and uh, will you just explain that to us a little more? Yes. Um, so we had this um, appropriations for school nurses. We got around 2008 was the, the first year we did that. Uh, and that was about a million dollars. It immediately went down to a little bit less. And a million dollars doesn't go very far in hiring the, you know, 900 nurses that we need. Um, but a, I don't remember how many years ago, but House Bill 373 that um, provided fu um, funding to $25 million for the school counselors, psychologists, um, social workers, and school nurses. So we know a lot of um, districts in particular. There's um, one district in Utah County that um, hired, that doubled their nursing um, staff so that their numbers significantly lowered. So uh, there's those options. Uh, and then other um, areas, th those are the only two state funding that I'm aware of um, until you know, the, the, the COVID funding came forward and we have some temporary funding that uh, might potentially be used for that, but it's temporary. So other than those two funding sources, I'm not sure where else they would get their money. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is, okay. can you just uh, briefly describe for us how COVID affected what you do and and how you were able to uh, help or, or provide relief or uh, do something for students during this pandemic? Uh, for, I, I'm assuming you don't mean me specifically, but you mean the school nurses in the schools? 
Yes, so they were last year pulled from their regular duties, which would be um, administering first aid and emergency care, writing health care plans, training staff, uh, supervising those people they've trained to, those kinds of things, and almost exclusively were working on COVID duties. Um, testing in some cases, contact tracing in most cases, was being done at the school, uh, and then just enforcing. And so um, the data from this last year, in this last year's report, we know might not be as accurate as the years before, just because the nurses weren't doing their nursing specific jobs. Um, the contact tracing and the testing could be done by anybody. It didn't have to be a nurse. And so eventually it got to the point where they were having other staff members do the, the testing and the contact tracing so that the nurses could get back to their actual duties. But um, as we were transitioning through this last year and uh, how the COVID affected everything that everybody in schools did, um, changed a little bit. So they're kind of back this year into doing more of the nursing functions, which is like I mentioned, all those other things, you know, the writing and the healthcare plans and training the staff and delegating medication and supervising and, and those kinds of things and have left the, the COVID responsibilities in most cases to the health, um, health local health officers and the local health departments. Um, next we is uh, member Booth. Member Norton. Could you just take a moment and give us a little bit more background on how school nurses uh, are impacted by the ever increasing mental health issues that they're dealing with with students? Uh, yes. So uh, one reason they were added to that House Bill 373 funding, they weren't part of the original thing, but um, bill, but in one of the subsequent ones they were added, is because sometimes the school nurse is the first person that a student that a, um, a student will see who might be going into the office um, day after day complaining of a stomach ache, and as the nurse questions and then does a, a, a nursing assessment, they can determine this is not really physical related. This is more mental health related. And so they have the, the um, resources and they have access to other areas or other professionals in the community that they can help refer students to, to help provide those um, initial um, referrals for those students who may need to get a little bit more help. Uh, if it's the if it's the social worker, then they bring the social worker in, and if it's the psychologist, they can bring the psychologist in. But typically, or in, in a lot of situations, it's the school nurse that that might first identify that this might be an issue, that it might be a mental health issue instead of a physical issue. Thank you, Member Norton. So I am a classroom teacher, and one of the things that I've noticed um, growing exponentially over let's say the last five years is allergies and allergies in the schools. Um, have you, is that, I mean, is that continuing to grow? Or are we leveling out? I, I know that has a huge impact with our school nurses and, mm -hmm. and the education that they're doing and, um, and you know, making um, areas for those children to eat safely. But are we seeing any leveling off or or how's that how's that going in schools these days it doesn't um, seem to be in my area but i was just wondering for you statewide it uh, i don't know i don't know the exact answer to that i don't have the data in front of me to to compare and look at the last five years that i've been collecting it where the numbers have gone it may be that um, parents are recognizing that they have rights and they can ask for the accommodations in the classroom and that's why we might be finding out that there's more in the past um, and I just wanted to kind of mention on, um, with sp uh, allergies specifically, we get a lot of requests for a peanut-free classroom or a nut-free or whatever the allergen is or a, um, or a school. And that is not something that we recommend. I just had a recent email about this from uh, a school. It, uh, because there, there's just no way, there may be a kindergarten student that that is all, or first grade, because they don't eat lunch, but uh, a first grade student that will only eat peanut butter and you cannot restrict other students from that, but you can be a, a nut aware or a peanut aware class or school and just um, find ways in that classroom or in that school to make sure that that student with the, those specific allergies is safe, whether it's um, a nut free table or um, eating in a d different location in an office, in a classroom, something where they still have. Um, they can, they can be kept safe, but take a friend who won't be bringing peanuts or whatever the allergen is that particular day. Mm. Have you noticed any other 
um, increases in allergies in your experience? Um, I, I think that we're just more aware of, of the allergies now. Um, you know, that they, allergies and medical conditions can range from mild to severe. And so we're just noticing more, in my opinion, um, in my experience. Um, but um, we definitely know how to, to react and to make sure our students are safe. And the schools are getting really good at that, too. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Davis. I just want to thank you both for your good work. Um, Betty Sue Hinkson was um, the school nurse where I was the principal for a few years. And she was so good at training our staff that one summer, a teacher over the summer embroidered her favorite <laughs> nurse Hinkson quote and gave it to her when she came to do our training for our faculty. And it was this lovely embroidery. And it said, if it's warm and wet and not yours, don't touch it. <laughs> and I have lived by that rule ever since because you trained me well. Um, but really, I just really want to make the point that our school nurses are very few and far between, and they have heavy, heavy workloads and caseloads. And especially um, this last year, I know you had more put on, on you than you should have had to do. And um, thanks for working for our kids. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other um, questions or, or comments, so I think it's probably a good place to turn it back to the superintendent. Well, I think Vice Chair Davis uh, summarized well, actually. So I want to give a shout out to all of our school nurses, but just add that uh, Kendra and Betty Sue also have been part of the School Health Advisory Group. The Department of Health, our uh, healthcare professionals really look to these great ladies for their expertise of what's happening in the schools from a health perspective. So they've gone above and beyond, and I just thought it was so important to put all of this information in front of you and in front of the public, and thank you for, for the time and the attention to school nurses. Thank you. Thank you. You, you know, I think we ought to just give you one of these. Mm -hmm. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Could I just say one last thing? You um, bet. It, you know, it's really hard to recognize a school nurse because they, they do it out of their their heart and their soul. But this last year, um, Betty Sue Hinkson was the state nursing consultant for the entire United States. And I am just, su it's just such a pleasure to work next to her and her experience and what she has to offer our schools. It's just been a really nice to be here and to work with her. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate our, our state superintendent surrendering her time to a very good message here. She keeps us very well updated, it seems like, frequently. So now